during the times of the New Testament, historians tell us there were 80,000 slaves in Asia Minor. And when we open up our Bibles to the epistles that Paul wrote, he would speak to older people, he would speak to younger people, he would speak to men, he would speak to women, but he also would speak to slaves. That people were coming to Christ and they were slaves. And that's something that it's not something we're used to in our modern society. But it was something that was prevalent there and they needed to have encouragement of how they should live their lives. Would you think much about what a slave could do for Christ? We might think, well, he's limited. But God writes and speaks through Timothy, who is to, writes to Titus and exhorts Titus to exhort people. And I read in Titus, the second chapter, and verse 9, exhort servants. Those are slaves. They're not ministers. They're bond servants. You exhort servants to be in subjection to their own masters and to be well-pleasing to them in all things, not gainsaying, but purloining, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. They are adorning something. They're not just putting it on. They're beautifying something. They are involved in adorning the doctrine of God. Who's doing that? Oh, your super Christians, your apostles, your, your preachers, your elders. No, slaves, bond servants. And I want us to observe that in this point about exhorting them to live and encourage them that in doing so, they would be adorning the doctrine of God. I want us to see a cry of a lot of people today that... I don't want to hear doctrine. Don't give me doctrine. I want some practical living information, preacher. That doctrine is, you know, you, that's for preachers and, or, or elders. That may be for people to discuss theology. But I want to know how I ought to live. Isn't it interesting that God places doctrine in connection with practical living? So practical that slaves were being addressed. That's practical living. That's living on a level that a lot of times we would not live, but you say, well, they just get a pass. You know, they, they belong to somebody else. They belong to Christ. And, and here's practical living. And I can see a slave listening to these things and said, thank you. Thank you for how I ought to live. And it's connected with the doctrine or the teachings of God. It also tells us by identifying the doctrine of God, there must be some other teachings out there that are not worthy to be something that we follow. All doctrine that's worthy to be followed is the doctrine of God. And notice that he says the doctrine of God, our Savior. In Titus, the first chapter, he says, well, our Savior is Jesus Christ. You're right. God is our Savior. You're right. And Titus 1 and verse 3, in his own seasons, he manifested his word in the message wherewith I was instructed according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Well, the next verse, taught us my true child after a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Two things there, God's our Savior, Jesus Christ is God. And we realize that here is God being addressed as, as Savior, Jesus Christ is indeed our Savior. In fact, in Titus, the t second chapter, verse 13, in our context, we're to be looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of the great God in our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we realize what doctrine comes from Jesus? What doctrine comes from God? That's, that's what is worthy to be followed because we can teach and preach the precepts of men and their doctrines. So we're looking for doctrine that is a foundation for practical living. We also realize it's going to have to come from the Word of God. And I would say sound doctrine is always practical. It's not something that should be divided. What is the teaching? And 
I have a responsibility as a preacher to make it practical to our living. But when you preach the word, notice if you just read the word of God, you're going to see the practicality of living for the slave just by reading God's word. But you want to live a godly life? Look at 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter and verse three. It's connected with, with the doctrine of God. When he says, if any man teacheth a different doctrine, he surely can. And consenteth not to sound words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Godliness is practical living. It's living with piety toward God. Where do I find how to do that? Doctrine. It's the, the word of God that will accomplish that. Elders, you want to know what to use to exhort people? With sound words, Titus 1 and verse 9, you're to be holding the faithful word which is according to the teaching or the doctrine that you may be able both to exhort in the sound doctrine and to convict the gainsayers, those who try to contradict the truth of God. You take that word with that sound teaching and you're able to exhort them there, how to live godly lives, how to exhort people in the way that's practical with the, the teachings of Christ. So when we look at doctrine don't ever say well i wish we had some sermons on practical living they're found in the doctrine in fact you don't have something worthy to be practiced if it's not found in the doctrine of our lord what does it mean to adorn the doctrine then this word is perfect it's now complete it's something that it's not of man, it's, it's, of, it's of God. How could you ever beautify that, the message of God? The point is, is that's what we're doing. Do you see the word cosmetics in this Greek word adorn? I do. And when you realize that the word in the Greek denoted the idea of arranging or setting things in order. And that's what we're observing that's happening. And we see that, well, that's, that's the cosmetics. Here's a, here's a woman, and she beautifies herself with the, with the makeup. And we think about staging a house to sell. What do we do? We fix it up. We adorn it. We arrange things. We want to show people not an empty shell of a house, but something that, oh, I could live in that. That's just so, the, I like that idea. My, my couch could fit there too. Thank you for showing that to me. But we're beautifying something. We're putting something in an in a orderly fashion. And that's what we bring to the Word of God. We're going to adorn it by practicing it. So we're making things ready. This word is used, for example, in Matthew 25 and verse 7, that the virgins were to trim the lamps, making them ready. In Matthew 23, 29, they would take the, the graves of the prophets. They would indeed be adorning them, beautifying them. The foundation stones into that heavenly kingdom in Revelation 21 and verse 19. They are adorned, that foundation is adorned with precious stones. And women who adorn themselves in modest apparel, that is well arranged, fit for the occasion. They are adorning uh, what God teaches. They're adorning their bodies in the right type of, of attire. I'm putting it in order. I'm making it ready. And there is beauty in that. Just like when a woman has made herself up, there's beauty in that. Not like Jezebel. Just the right stuff. There's, there's beauty in that. And that's, we get our word from that. And this inner man is what we're emphasizing. For example, to the to women in 1 Peter 3 and verse 5, Apostle Peter speaks about the character of the, of the wife and she is submitting to her, her husband. And it's like the women of old. Notice what they did. They bring honor to themselves because they are adorning themselves with what? Who's adorning, verse 3, let it not be the outward adorning of braiding the hair and wearing jewels or gold or putting on apparel. And we're using that as an example, but it's something deeper than that. We're talking about the inner man. But let it be the hidden man of the heart 
an incorruptible power of a meek and quiet spirit, which is the son of God of great price. And then verse 5. For after this manner aforetime, the holy women also who hoped in God adorned themselves. Now, would he be speaking about the inward man? He said they adorned themselves and we're talking about their outward attire? No. He's still talking about the inward man. They adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. Well arranged, in the sight of God of great price. They may not have had a lot of beautiful clothes, but they adorned themselves by submitting to their husbands, well arranged for the order that God would have them to manifest in their life. And they gained honor by adorning themselves in such a manner. What is practical then is to have well arranged lives that are manifesting the teaching that comes into your heart. And it proves so much. Remember Romans 12 and verse 12. Well, we're, we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're not fashioned according to this world. That's not what determines who we're going to be, but we have the transforming of our mind and the renewing of our mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I'm just saying that here is this child of God that indeed is going to follow a different master and we take that doctrine and we live it out in our lives. We are adorning the doctrine. We are bringing beauty to that doctrine. It's, 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 it's being made practical in our lives. We'll prove, not only to ourselves, but we'll prove to the outside world what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And here are lowly saves, may not have much of a future, God says, oh, I see where you are, and you're adorning the doctrine of God. You can do that. And we can do that by putting it into practice in our lives. The doctrine of God, it's all-encompassing. It affects every part of your life. One of the beautiful things about the Bible, two things. It covers, as far as I can tell, all the relationships that we enter into. And what keeps it modern is that they get tied up in one culture. It speaks in principles that we can take in our modern times, even though we might not have slavery as prevalent as we have in the first century. But it dealt with all the relationships. We're looking at slave master. You see that again, Ephesians 6 and 1 Timothy 6. I don't care if they were believing masters. They were to treat their, their slaves the way they should be treated. They have a judge that's going to judge them. But then slaves may have believing masters, and they're to serve them. And unbelieving masters, they're to serve them. And there's the idea of recognition of, of age and sex in Titus the second chapter leading in to slavery of the slaves in this, in this uh, chapter. There's a sense of the family relationship. Ephesians 5 and verse 6, children, par you know, parents and husbands and, and wives. It deals with, well, here's how you treat friends. This is a need, need to how you treat your enemies. In Matthew 5, 43, 48, we have those relationships. We live under a government. And we find that God realizes this is an area that you need to think about, dear Christian, and honor the government. And there's times, and I use 2 Corinthians 4, we see our outward man decaying, we see the things affecting our life, and then we realize that we have home in heaven waiting for us. It takes us from this earth to heaven. Individuals under government. Individuals in relationships of marriage and parenthood and our work as, as we've, we, we've taken principle, the slave and master relationship, regardless of age or sex, God has spoken. And he's made that doctrine practical because we're going to live it out in our lives. So we say, well, where would I not need the doctrine of God? Where would I need to do something that I can't go to God's word to find a principle that maybe ought to help me? You can't. God has spoken. 
And God knows us, and it seems to realize that you know, he's, he's spoken about these things, and yet he does it in terms like modest apparel. We're not running around with robes to our ankles, not wearing the same type of, of clothes that, that was modern for them. But we look at those principles and we can apply that to modest apparel, well arranged, covering our nakedness and covering our shame. All those things are there. It is an all-encompassing doctrine that indeed these slaves could be indeed adorning the doctrine of God in everything. Not only the relationship to their masters, but all facets of their living. They had children. They lived under governments. They were male, they were female, they were young, they were old. And he's just saying, here is your relationship to your master. I'm speaking there, but this is encompassing all things. It is an all-encompassing doctrine, this word of God. And it's all penetrating, too. It goes within us. I want you to notice three things about what he says to the slaves here. And I just put it out there as the deportment. How are you going to act? Your relationship to your master, what do you do? You obey them. You submit to them, be in subjection unto their own master, and to be well-pleasing to them in all things. That's your deportment. That's the action of a slave. Or if they don't treat me right, we still see from God's word that you're supposed to obey even the forward, Peter says. So there's my job, there's my deport, that's my responsibility. Thank you, God, for that practical living, because that's I'm supposed to be do that in, in all things. Secondly, what's your disposition when you do it? What is your attitude? Not gainsaying, not contradicting them, and we find ourselves with that attitude that we're just kind of, uh, you know, gains and we're just, we're, we're going against them all the time and it comes out in our, our speech, but it's our attitude toward them. He speaks about that. And then he says, not stealing from them, but in, in not doing that, but also, but also the idea of being faithful to them. There's the consistency, the dependability. They can trust you. And those are three things that we see in this teaching that says, I are in all things, in all facets of life, but I'm a slave. Now, what does that? He said, I'm going to take you inside. I'm going to talk about the action. I'm going to talk about the attitude about that. And I'm talking about how consistent are you in putting that into practice. And the doctrine of God demands all three. When we want to adorn it. We want to beautify it because it deals with our action, it deals with our words, it deals with our attitude, and it deals with our consistency and carrying out day in and day out. That's what this doctrine of God does. If any part is ignored, it puts off a bad picture. It's harmful. It's not adorning the doctrine of God. We can have the right action. In Philippians, the second chapter, in verses 14 and 15, we may be doing things, but our attitude, we do all things, you're not to do things with murmurings and questionings. Here's what God says, I'll carry it out, but I'm grabbing about it. I'm resisting it. And we began to realize I, I may be doing something that's, that's what God wants me to do, but, but in doing that, I have that wrong attitude. And I'm supposed to eliminate that so I'll be harmless children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation amongst whom you're seen as lights in the world. What beautifying light are you giving out when you said, this is what I've got to do, and I'm grappling about it all the time. And we can't have that. We may be doing something right, 1 Peter 4 and verse 9. Be hospitable without murmuring. You just ruined it. 
but I sure did do my duty. I was hospitable to them, but you murmured about it. Is that adorning the doctrine of God? I did the right thing, but I had the wrong attitude. Oh, I love freedom in Christ. Galatians 5 and verse 13, what, what an attitude that I have. I am free in Christ, but you're not free to give in to the lust of the flesh. It's not a license to give in to the lust of the flesh. In Galatians 5, 13, I think presents us for uh, when, when, he, when he tells us that we are called for freedom. But only use not your freedom for an occasion to the flesh, but through love be servants one of another. So we see I can have doing something hospitable, be hospitable, I can have the wrong attitude, I can have the right attitude, I'm free, but do something with the wrong action. That's not adorning the doctrine of God. And I can start off with the right action, and I can go for a while, and I can be cleansed from the defilements of this world, and I can be living a holy life before God, but then I quit, and I quit. And Second Peter, the second chapter, verses 20 and 20, 22 through 22. That's, that's short, isn't it? Second Peter 2. Notice in verse 21, when he says it had been better for them. Well, what, what happened in verse 20? For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome by those same things that they had Cleansing from the defilements of the world. They're entangled again. The last state has become worse than the first. It's better for them not to know the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment. They're like dogs returning to their vomit. And like a sow that had washed back to wallowing in the mire. They go back into the world. And you know, that is a sad picture. I thought over the years how many people that have left the Lord in our community. And they once accepted the teachings of Christ. They once lived that life as a Christian. And they've gone back in the world. What example to the world are they now? It's not a, it's not a good one. And it's probably one that's, oh, you were, you were a Christian one time. And uh, why aren't you? You're not. And they may have all their different reasons about why they're not. But that's not a very wonderful, beautiful picture of Christianity, is it? And we need all three of these things together. The action with the proper attitude and continue in it to be adorning the doctrine of God. It is beautiful when it's applied. You know, we can say a lot. Of I remember watching the Andy Griffith show back in a long, long time ago, and Aunt B. And one time in one episode, Aunt B was talking to all of her lady friends that she was getting a fur coat. They probably wouldn't have that episode anymore, would they? Oh, harsh. We don't want fur coats. But that time, it was nice to have one. And all those ladies said, sure, Aunt B, sure. That's nice. You, you talk about that. But one day, she showed up in Mayberry with a fur coat. And all those ladies were talking about her. It made a difference. Not that they liked it. They're jealous now. She can talk about it and it didn't make a big difference. But once she wore it, once she had put that on and, and now was walking in and all the beauty of that, oh, it made a, quite a difference to, to the people around her. That's what Christianity does. You can talk all day long about Christianity. But as 1 John 3 tells us that we're, in verse 18, we're not to love in our tongue and word, but in deed and truth. That's the person that makes a difference. That that doctrine is applied in our actions and, and how our attitude is manifested in doing it. And that we're consistently involved in doing that. I appreciate you being here tonight.
There's a lot of reasons why you say, well, I've got to go see this and see this family. This family's come in, but you're here tonight. And he said, well, that's the way I live my life, and I think you've made some good decisions and, and good habits are formed. But that, that's what makes a difference in our lives. The people say, you, you go to services all the time? Yes, when, we have, when we're supposed to be here, we do. Well, this is a special time we don't have to? No, we're here. And it makes a difference, and we want to do that. There's a beauty in holiness and being totally set apart for God. In Psalm 29, we see the holy array set forth. And it's, it's people ascribing to God. Here's, here's the worshiper that's ascribing to God his greatness. Ascribe unto Jehovah, O ye sons of the mighty. Ascribe unto Jehovah glory and strength. Ascribe unto Jehovah the glory due to his name. It's about him. But worship Jehovah in holy array. Worship Jehovah in holy array. Totally dedicated to ascribing to him the glory that he deserves. We're totally set apart for his glory. And therefore we're totally set apart unto him. There were people that honored God with their lips, but their heart was far from them. Matthew 15, 1 through 9. They were setting aside the word of God so they could deal with their traditions. And they had it all fixed. Where we won't take care of mom and dad because I'll take, I'm, I'm dedicated unto God. And he's just trying to say, you set that aside. You say you honor me, but your actions and connection with doctrine tell us differently. We're to worship God in spirit and truth. And that truth is God's word that separates us, John 17, 17. We are, we're sanctified in that truth. Thy word is truth, O God, as he addresses his father. And it's just holy array. I want to encourage you to keep putting that doctrine in your life. We're dealing with women and men. We're dealing with young people. As we go into God's word, that's how we beautify it. And then I want to make one application. Over the last few years, and it's been now 20 some odd years, when there was division among churches, even among our people, dealing with fellowship over matters of divorce and remarriage. What was interesting in, in all of those times, there were men that were teaching a different doctrine on divorce and remarriage. And what happened is that, well, I can fellowship that man who teaches a different doctrine of what we see in God's word. And we can remain and have fellowship with them. And they're caused great divisions. So how can we do that? We've got to make up our mind what doctrine we're going to follow. We realize that here we, we need to, we can follow a different doctrine. That's not the doctrine of God. So what is the doctrine of God regarding divorce and remarriage? And marriage, divorce and remarriage. What is that? And we, we looked at passages, Matthew 19, not whosoever. That applies to everybody. Puts away his wife except for fornication, marrieth another, commit adultery. Commit adultery. We got that. And we say that, that is easy to understand. And our brethren, I think, manifest it. So many. Is that the, the problem of division was not over what does the doctrine say? The people who are advocating a different basis for fellowship were all in agreement about what the teaching says. There's only one reason to put away a wife that gives you a right to marry another, and that's fornication. That's clear. That wasn't what the battle was about. It was about the fellowship side of it. What do you do? When there's people teaching different doctrines. I, I have a book in my library. There are 13 different ways to look at Matthew 19.9. 9, according to that author. But there's only one way to look at it for truth. The problem is not with God. The problem is with us. And I, I, I saw this in going into other countries and taking their Bible. And I had a lady wanting to get rid of her husband because he's always going over there in England. And she's over in, in Lithuania. He said, can I just, just put him away because I never see him anymore? 
Now, I took the Lithuanian Bible and let her read it. She said, oh. And I was waiting for another hour of discussion. It settled it. She says, I can't. Because he doesn't commit fornication. She read it. She understood it. And you know, most of the brethren I knew had a teaching. But there was teaching that was saying, well, you can put away before you become a Christian and marry before you become a Christian. But when you become a Christian, you're going to have to stay one man, one woman for the rest of your life. But you could do that. And we began to look at passages that Jesus said, whosoever does this, that applies to everybody. And Jesus says in John 12, 48, that, that he's going to judge the world. His word will judge the world. How can you judge the world if the world's not under your word anymore? So we had to bring those things. I'm taking the teachings of God. But it caused a lot of disruption. And... And people divided over that, though it wasn't a, 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 a big formal thing. The division's still here. But people say, you know, it's, uh, it's not a problem any longer. No, that problem is still here. And I want us to realize we take the doctrine of God. What happens when we have the right doctrine, but we have the wrong attitude? That will tell the world, one man, one woman for life. That's what God teaches. And can show them that indeed there's only one reason for putting away. And, and the world said, that's too strict. He said, I know it. I, I just, the way God does it. And, and, and you complain about it. You're not adorning the doctrine of God. Why would you ever be ashamed of what God says? But you can have the right doctrine and have the wrong attitude. And you can sometimes have the right attitude. I don't want to bring a burden on somebody. This person, as a young person, they, had to, they, they were divorced, and now they don't have a right to a mate. And you know, it's hard for a young person to remain uh, celibate all of their life. And uh, therefore, I, I have the right attitude. I don't want to put a, more of a burden upon them than they have. And that's good attitude. But then you go to the wrong doctrine. It says, well... Since you can't remain single, it's all right for you to marry. Where does God's doctrine teach that? I find in God's word in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there's no, there's nothing that God has placed upon you that is too hard to bear. That there's no temptation that you can't bear as a child of God. God is faithful. He's not going to allow that, but he didn't change his doctrine just for you or for that person. There has no temptation taken you, but such as a man can bear. But God is faithful, who will not suffer to be tempted above that which you're able. Yeah, because he's going to change the doctrine. I can marry. No. But will the temptation make also the way of escape that you'll be able to endure it? Yes, things can be difficult. And we might have a right attitude. I don't want to put hardship on somebody else. So let's change the doctrine a little bit on divorce or marriage. No. Right attitude. Wrong doctrine. But then I realize adorning the doctrine to be consistent. Just because someone of note has a doctrine that is different from what you say is the truth, what I say is the truth, what we understand as being the truth, and no one's been arguing that. It's just this person looks at it differently. And you find a way to keep things together because of the respect that you have for that person. That's what happened over the last few decades. When Oprah Haley, well respected, believed that an alien is not subject to God's marriage law and that when you become a Christian, the other side of his teaching was the fact that it washed away all your sins, including your adultery and marrying somebody else. Now you're clean to stay with the one that you have. Did he have a right attitude in the sense that he wanted people to be saved and to not break up homes? There's some wonderful attitudes there. He writes a book 
of the divorce that would come to God. That shows me the heart of, of caring about people. That's a good attitude, wrong doctrine. And we realize that that's the case. So what did our brethren do? They say, well, we will not have such people that follow his doctrine. We can't have them in our fellowship. But we can fellowship the man who taught them. That's not consistency. And in order for us to adorn the doctrine, we apply it to everyone. We apply that one teaching to everyone. Whosoever does this. I'm going to judge the world. My word will judge the world. John 12, 48. His word has come on divorce and marriage and what marriage and divorce and remarriage is all about. We honor that and we apply it to everyone. But that's not what happened. And you wonder why, why there's division. Brother Haley is dead and gone. Men are getting older who advocated fellowshipping him, but not maybe the people that followed his teaching. They're getting older. They're going to meet their, their judge as well. We'll meet ours, our Lord Jesus Christ. In the meantime, let's be adorning the doctrine of God. Right doctrine, right attitude, always trying to be consistent. Because what is led to is so many smoke screens. Now we question the word of God. Maybe it's not so clear on divorce and remarriage. It's really, well, you know, everybody believes different things. So what happens? That idea of fellowship on those, it just goes underground. We just, oh, local churches, they do what they're going to do. And we don't talk about it. And that's just one doctrine. But we need to find out what the truth is. We need to apply it with the right attitude, the right deportment, and also be consistent. Because I find it is totally inconsistent to have fellowship with a man who teaches people that we believe are going to hell for they're living the life that they are. But he's okay because he sincerely believed it. Maybe they sincerely believe it too. But we won't have them in our fellowship they didn't 20 years ago, but I wonder if they have them now. Because that, as we don't like to look in the mirror and see a hypocrite. And so what do we do? We let them all in. And that can happen. But that's not following the doctrine of God. I want every one of us to be people who are adorning the doctrine of God. And you can do that. Slaves were told to do that. And we can do that in all facets of our life. So as we look at a, a new year coming and the wonderful opportunities that we have to, to manifest Christ in our lives to the world, this is how you do it. Right action, right attitude, and consistency. And we will be the people that God's pleased with, and we'll be the people that are beautifying the doctrine of God and realizing that doctrine is practical. Watch it in our lives. And we'll be the pleasing we be pleasing God with our lives. If you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to become one this evening. If you know that Jesus died for you and was raised for your justification, you realize those are the, the, the foundation for our salvation in Christ and, and you've been thinking about Him, we need to realize you need to move from being thinking about Him and obeying Him. People, when they obeyed the gospel, they repented of their sins, they were baptized into Christ. They confessed who He was. Let that expression of the heart come out with your lips and make confession of who he is. Repent of your sins, turn from them, and be baptized this evening. And we're here to assist you. Come as we stand and as we sing.